All right, thanks again for joining us. My name is Joelle Shea, and on behalf of the entire GeoDecisions and Gannett Fleming team, we're so excited that you chose to spend an hour with us today. And we've got a fantastic presentation in store for you, but safety first. Safety is an important part of our culture at GeoDecisions and Gannett Fleming. As you can see, we even have a slogan, safety is in our hands. And it's customary that we start our meetings with a safety moment. Given the time of year and the recent news of a Hollywood actress drowning while swimming, let's talk about safety in and near water. Recommendations from the Red Cross include swim in designated areas supervised by lifeguards, swim with a buddy, not alone, have children or inexperienced swimmers wear US Coast Guard approved life jackets around water, but do not rely solely on the life jackets. And if you have a pool, secure it with appropriate barriers. Visit www.redcross.org for more information about safety in and near water. Now on to today's presentation. Lifelong learning is another core value at GeoDecisions and Gannett Fleming. So when COVID-19 hit and industry professionals were left wondering how they could replace the learning that they received at conferences, we jumped at the chance to help by creating this webinar series. We're now on our 12th webinar, Increase Transparency with State Funding Systems. Let's get to know our speakers a bit before we get started. First up, Lindsay Duncan. Lindsay joined GeoDecisions in 2013 as a GIS specialist and currently serves as Senior Project Manager, leading teams and collaborating with clients on their GIS and application development projects. For the past four years, she has worked closely with the Infrastructure and Investment Division and the Information Technology Department at VDOT to build the Smart Portal application. Lindsay's team has designed tools within the Smart Portal that not only aid VDOT in project evaluation, but also help the public understand where state dollars are allocated and why. When she's not leading agile scrum ceremonies, you can likely find Lindsay in the woods foraging for mushrooms with her daughter or riding, and she tells me sometimes also falling off of her mountain bike. And Chad Tucker. Chad started his career as a transportation planner in VDOT's Transportation and Mobility Planning Division in 1999. Over the past five years, he helped lead the development and implementation of the smart scale prioritization process. He currently works in the Virginia Secretary of Transportation's Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment, where he oversees the smart scale program and works to improve policies and processes related to transportation planning, project development, and project evaluation. Chad is an, also an avid collector of grills and other outdoor cooking appliances. So sounds like he's probably a pretty popular friend to have this time of year. All right, I know we're ready for takeoff, but we have two more pre-flight announcements before we can get started. We know many of you are joining to earn a PDH or GISP credit. In accordance with regulations, you must stay on the line for at least 50 five zero minutes. And please type your questions into the Q&A section of the WebEx, not the chat or the private message, but the Q&A section, and our speakers will address them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Lindsay. Thanks, Joelle. Uh, so for our presentation today, we've got a brief agenda. Um, Chad's gonna start with talking about the smart scale program and process. And then I will talk about the Smart Portal application solution that ties in with that. We'll go over a couple of lessons learned for you and then turn it over to Q&A. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chad now to talk about SmartScale. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, <clears throat> one thing to make you aware of is that there's a bird outside of where my office is that's like the Robert Plant of birds. Uh, so you may hear some chirping. Uh, so just, just be mindful of that. Um, again, my name is Chad Tucker. I work in the Secretary of Transportation's Office of Intermodal Planning and Investment and have been involved in Virginia's smart scale process since its inception. Um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good program. It has evolved over time and I think really serves as a model to other states on how to potentially set up a performance-based programming process uh, in your state. 
Um, next slide. All right. So what exactly is uh, smart scale? Uh, in its simplest form, it's essentially a, it's a set of policies and, and methods used to evaluate proposed transportation improvements uh, in Virginia and to inform the funding process that our Commonwealth Transportation Board goes through to select problem, uh, select projects and put them into Virginia's Capital Improvement Program for Transportation, also referred to as the Six-Year Improvement Program. Um, it is based on a, an objective sort of outcome-based metrics. So we're not looking at the size of the problem as much as we're looking at how is the investment going to move the needle with respect to performance. Um, it's been used over uh, the last four years. We've gone through three rounds of the smart scale process um, and has been used to allocate well over three and a half billion dollars in funding uh, for over ten billion dollars in improvements. So one of the things you'll learn from our process is it does encourage applicants, localities, uh, being cities, counties, towns, uh, metropolitan planning organizations and PDCs, as well as public transit providers. It encourages them to leverage uh, funding either at the local level or the regional level or private in investments. And has really increased the amount of purchasing power that we have as a state uh, to make investments in the transportation system. Uh, next slide. Um, a little bit of background on how it came to be. Uh, the process would not have come to, to fruition had it not been for uh, the leadership, both at the executive branch level in Virginia, as well as the legislative branch. So at the time the smart scale legislation was passed requiring the CTD to develop an objective-based process to score projects. We had a Democratic governor, but we had a Republican-controlled legislature. And they were able to come together um, and see the value in coming up with a better way to select transportation projects. There's a limited amount of revenues that I think we all deal with throughout, um, throughout America and you know, they said, we've got to come up with a better way. And there's a couple of things that I think prompted and really brought the political support behind developing and mandating the smart scale process in Virginia. Um, so essentially, the, um, the CTB's job is to allocate construction funds and um, to set up the, the improvement program. And the intent is that they'll select the highest scoring projects but they do have the ability to make adjustments based on other, what I would say are softer considerations. And this is very much, it happens, but it's not that frequent. So I would say that the smart scale scoring process drives anywhere between not, you know, around 95% of the funding decisions. But there are examples where the board may decide it's in the best interest of the state to deviate. So an example there, um, might be that we've completed two phases of a three-phase project. The third phase is right below the cutoff line, and they want to go ahead and get that, that phase complete so that the project is, is done. It took us about uh, 14 months to develop, uh, 14 to 16 months to develop the process, and the board adopted it in June of, of 2015. Next slide. Um, the legislation that created smart scale, there was a, uh, a complementary legislative package that was also passed that set up the funding that was going to be used to fund the smart scale program. So it's sort of a two part legislative process, one mandating that the process be set up and providing an overall framework of what the process needed to consider. And then the second half being, these are the funding, this is the additional funding that we're gonna to bring to the process to get improvements implemented. So it sort of re-indexed the way Virginia had historically done uh, or developed or 
receive transportation revenues. In the past, a lot of it was indexed off of gas sales, but as we know, gas sales are going down um, overall, and then you've got electric vehicles coming. So there were structural changes to how transportation is funded, um, bringing in sales tax and uh, re-indexing the, the gas tax to provide more um, more more funding. Um, the a couple other things were, um, you know, lawmakers wanted to show to the public that we were good stewards of the dollars and that we were spending money in a cost-effective manner. Um, there was concern that often the most urgent needs weren't being pushed forward, that there were a lot of politics in the decision-making process, uh, and that the process for selecting projects was very opaque. It wasn't very transparent. There wasn't uh, justification or rationale to why certain projects would be picked over others. Um, and so this was some of the context um, leading up to Virginia saying we, we've got to do it a different way. Next slide. Now, there was the overall sense that, uh, and I'm sure a lot of states can relate to this, that a lot of the project selection or some of the project selection is being driven by politics. Um, and there was a project right before the General Assembly and the executive branch really said, hey, we need to do something different that I think, in my opinion, was the straw that broke the camel's back. And that was the 460 project between Richmond and Hampton Roads. Um, if you're not familiar with Route 460, it's a four lane undivided roadway. Doesn't really have it doesn't have any congestion issues. It doesn't really have any safety issues. But the decision was made to push forward a project that was a four lane divided facility on new location parallel to the existing roadway. Um, it was almost a billion and a half dollars and 300 million was spent before the core had even issued permits. So it was was being pushed politically um, and we ended up losing a significant amount of money with the contract when the core ultimately did not issue the permits and the contract had to be canceled. And I think that probably more so than any other event was was really the the spark that ignited the flame of support for let's we got to do something different. We can't have projects like this. And there were other examples over the years, the 29 bypass in Charlottesville, the outer connector in Fredericksburg, where politics were involved and the state was pushing uh, a project that didn't was not really a high priority at a local regional level. And, you know, we ended up just spending a lot of money either on right away or project development. Uh, and had nothing to really show for it. So um, smart scale was intended to address these issues. And I think these are issues that aren't unique to Virginia. There are issues that occur throughout the nation. Next slide. So some of the keys to political support is we needed to have a broad based evaluation that looked at a lot of different factor areas so that everybody could see that there was something in the process for them. Um, and the factors, I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, the, pro the process also needs to recognize, uh, as in many states, one part of the state's not the same as the other part of the state. It's not a homogeneous um, community. And so the process needs to be flexible to that and recognize that a what drives project selection in, say, a rural area is very different from what drives project selection in a urban, uh, highly dense. We also had the goal that we wanted the process to be mode neutral. In other words, we didn't want to have a separate process for highways and for bike ped and for transit, so on and so forth. We wanted to have one set of methods that were flexible enough to be able to evaluate projects across the different modes. Um, and, you know, as far as the process implementation, we wanted it to be as transparent as possible, not just the ultimate process, but the process for creating the process. So we had a lot of public meetings, a lot of information on the web, a lot of stakeholder outreach to refine the methods and measures and tweak the weightings that we were going to give different area types. 
Um, and so we tried to do all of that as transparent as possible with folks having the ability to influence the process. I think had we not done that, we would not have gotten as much buy-in as quickly as we did um, if we had just gone into a locked room and developed the process in a vacuum and then presented, you know, an 80% there process. Uh, we really took people along the journey, and I think it paid off. It, it was very painful at the time that we did it, but I think it paid off having meetings throughout the state uh, with the frequency that we did to sort of build that buy-in. And then the other thing we wanted to make sure is once we start funding projects with this process, let's make sure we deliver. And that we're not just delivering on time and on budget, we're delivering before the deadline and under budget. And so there's been a, I would say a parallel effort within VDOT and DRPT to make sure the smart scale projects are being implemented as quickly and efficiently uh, as we possibly can so that people can see the results of the process sooner. Um, and that, that hopefully, uh, you know, lends itself to continued support for the process in the Commonwealth. Next slide. So again, um, just touch on this real quick, that public engagement is really critical and you can go ahead and go to the next slide while I talk through. Um, we met in every construction district, we met individually with each MPO, we met with each PDC. Um, I can't remember the exact stat, we used to have it. I wanna say in a six to eight month period, we put somewhere between 15 and 20,000 miles on the state car, just driving around the state to different meetings and um, you know, it was very exhausting, but I think in the end it really paid off. Um, we talked about this. There's that, you know, you had the legislation that required an objective process that looked at the different factor areas, but complementing that was reform refining the funding formulas. Um, and essentially it created a, a pot, a smart scale pot that we call the statewide high priority pot, which projects compete across the state for. And then 50% of the funds are distributed via formula to each of the nine construction districts in Virginia. And that was designed such that that district grant pot, they were getting as much or more than what they did under the previous funding formula. So you were guaranteed for projects that you were competing with in the district that the district as a whole was gonna get at least as much money as they were getting before under the old funding formula, which I think went a long way in sort of building that, um, that political support for the process early on. Next slide. Uh, so the way the smart scale process works is it's on a biennial basis. So every two years we're going through the process. Uh, while that may seem like a lot of time, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, downtime between rounds um, because you're sort of doing your post-mortem, what went well, what didn't go well, you're adjusting, you're, you're briefing the board on potential changes, and by the time you get through all that, you're back into the next round of intake. Um, Another couple critical, I guess, policy related issues. Every project that's selected for smart scale is fully funded to completion in the six year program. Um, this is really important. Um, in the past, we would partially fund projects. And I think the sense was we were wasting a lot of money as a state, starting PE, not having the money to initiate right away. By the time you have the money to initiate right away, you're having to go back and revisit the, the PE work that was done because it's now become stale, or you've got to revisit your NEPA work. Uh, it just wasn't a very efficient way of moving forward. So now projects are only put in the six-year program if they're funded through smart scale, if they are fully funded through all three phases, PE right away construction. This also gives a stronger sense to the consultant community that these projects are committed and are going to move forward. Um, we do solicit projects from uh, the eligible entities, which I went over earlier in even numbered years. And then another key thing um, that I, I make a, a, a point of mentioning <clears throat> when I'm presenting to other states and other regions on this, 
the CTB, which is the, the Commonwealth Transportation Board in Virginia, does not see the scores before the public sees the scores. And I think that's fairly unique to how Virginia's process works. And we felt was important to ensure there was transparency in the process. So the day that we present to the board is the day that the, the scores in January are released to the public and to the applicants. Um, and we feel that's important to keep the process as pure as possible. Um, and so far it hasn't, hasn't been an issue, but I think that was a courageous policy move early on by the board and by the secretary's office to say, hey, we don't want there to, in the future, for there to be any um, uh, enticement to say, well, I don't like the way the results came out. Uh, so, and then there'd be pressure on staff to make modifications. So it was felt that the best way to prevent that from occurring would be everybody sees the results at the same exact time. Um, now that's not to say we don't make mistakes, but again, I think I'll get into that later on, lessons learned, that when we do make mistakes, we don't sweep it under the rug, no matter how small the mistake is, we own it, we work very uh, upfront about it, uh, we talk to the board about it, make it public, and say what the issue is and how we're going to fix it. So next slide. All right, so um, what do we use to evaluate projects? This is the extent pretty much the extent of the direction we got from the General Assembly, from the state legislature. They said, you need to consider safety, congestion, accessibility, land use, environmental quality, and economic development. They didn't tell us how we had to consider those. And I think that was, that's rare that a legislature gives you that much um, leeway as a staff to figure stuff out, but it really, I think, helped us develop a better process because we had the general framework that we would operate under, but we weren't told how to measure safety or how to measure congestion or how to measure land use. And it gave us a lot of flexibility to start with a much bigger list of measures and then start to narrow in based on availability of data based on how resource intensive it would be to calculate that particular measure. Um, and I think it allowed us to right size the process given the resources and time that we were gonna have and what we felt was go gonna be measuring the outcomes of the project, which there was pushback you know, early on. We should measure how much delay there is and how many crashes there are. But you could have a lot of congestion and a lot of crashes and your project could be doing nothing to address those. And is, is, is the size of the problem as important as what the project is gonna do to move the needle on the problem? And so um, the flexibility the General Assembly afforded us allowed us the latitude to go in that direction and say, we'd rather focus on what the project's gonna do as opposed to how big the problem is where the project is, is gonna be located. Next slide. Now this, a lot of people don't realize, uh, that's where we get scale from Smart Scale. So Smart Scale is actually an acronym. Uh, if you're in, in state or local government, you know how much we bureaucrats just love the acronyms. Um, so SMART is the system for the management and allocation of resources for transportation. And then scale is essentially the, the different factors, safety, congestion, accessibility, land use. Um, and that's not as well known. I, we haven't really publicized it, but yeah, that sweet baby, that, that, that thing only cost $83,000. Um, and of course, I'm joking. It didn't cost that much. Um, couldn't have been any more than, than, than $47,000. Now, actually, our Secretary of Transportation came up with that, uh, Aubrey Lane, back when we were struggling and what to call this, and good Lord, I, I could show you a laundry list of acronyms that we went through. Um, so that's what Smart Scale stands for. Um, next slide. All right, so guiding principles, if you were considering developing a similar process in your state or your region. 
one, measure and analyze what matters to folks. Um, they, people care about delay. They care about reducing cr crashes and improving their access to various job opportunities. Um, so measure what's, you know, what's important. Um, you know, be, be as transparent as you possibly can. Um, keep in mind that your state or any area is going to have differences from one community to another and you can't, a one size fits all approach is not going to work. I would recommend you consider a process that doesn't break up and treat modes differently um, and try to minimize overlap and measures. And sometimes that can be quite a challenge because there is correlation between different measures. Next slide. All right, so we had some high level goals for each factor area of what we wanted to measure. And I'm gonna go through these really quickly. For, for safety, we wanted to reduce the number and rate of uh, fatal and injury crashes. Uh, for congestion, we wanted to reduce the person hours of delay and increase person throughput. And you'll notice it's not vehicle hours of delay, it's person hours. And that's important because of this multimodal uh, component that we were trying to, to keep. How's the project gonna increase access to jobs uh, and travel options for economic development? How's the project supporting economic development and improving the movement of goods? Uh, environmental quality, is the project gonna help improve air quality or is it gonna avoid impacts to the natural environment? And then land use, which is only applicable uh, in areas types A and B, which I'll get into here in a second. How does the project support transportation efficient land use patterns? So that's where local decisions can sort of play, um, whether they have mixed use, so on and so forth, can, can boost a project's score. Next slide. So the state, uh, I think we started off with six area types, but where we ended up landing was we broke the state down into four distinct area types. With category A or area type A being your most urban or your, you know, your most densely populated areas, so Northern Virginia, the Fredericksburg region, just to the south of Nova, uh, as well as Hampton Roads fall into area type A. And you'll see there what's weighted highest is congestion mitigation uh, with land use right behind it. So th those are areas where you have lots of congestion and where congestion mitigation really drives uh, decision making with respect to transportation improvements. Area type D, in contrast, is your more rural areas, your less densely populated areas in Virginia, and you'll notice there, congestion mitigation is a relatively small percentage, it's only 10%. What does drive transportation decision-making in those areas are economic development and safety. So those two measure areas are weighted much higher than the others. And with areas types B and C kind of being in, uh, somewhere in between those two, uh, those two areas. So this weighting, is what we apply at the end after we've calculated the benefit score. Next slide. So some of the impacts uh, in my observation of smart scale has been, it has definitely put a much greater emphasis on the project planning and the project development process. Uh, folks are really looking at ways to make their projects more effective, to make them leaner and meaner. Um, and make sure that they're developed enough that we can sufficiently calculate the benefits. Because the project does need to be fairly long in the planning process for us to be able to calculate those benefits. The third bullet I can't stress enough, and I always sort of highlight and reiterate this. It's not just the benefit, it's the benefit divided by the amount of money that the applicant's asking for. And so this is doing a couple of things. One, it, it encourages people to be cost effective and to not gold plate the projects. Secondly, because we only divide by the amount of money they're asking for, it does encourage localities and regions to leverage money if they 
feel strongly about a particular project because that is essentially going to reduce the amount of money they're asking for and will increase their score in the, in the end. Um, so this, this sort of cost effectiveness of taking the benefit score and dividing by cost, I think has done a lot of the good things in that it's brought down the overall cost of projects in Virginia over the last uh, three rounds and really has allowed folks or forced folks to rethink potential solutions. Um, you know, instead of widening a corridor, hey, you know, we just have some inefficient signals along this corridor. We need to look for ways to reduce signal phases, uh, reduce conflict points. We don't, we're not really that, you know, close to capacity. We just need to make the system operate more efficiently. So a lot more emphasis is being put on that than has ever been in the past. Um, I think it also is forcing folks to, to separate wants versus needs. You know, what are, what are truly the needs in their areas versus projects that, you know, they may just want. Uh, we've had examples of, you know, corridors, two lane roads with a thousand vehicles a day and the project is seeking to glide to four lanes. It doesn't meet a V-Trans need and, you know, it's going to screen out. So it really forces folks to rethink, you know, what are we, what is my goal? What is my objective? What am I trying to accomplish? Um, and then the, the, the last bullet there, really thinking beyond single occupant vehicles and capacity expansion. You know, a lot more investment's been occurring in bike ped, uh, in travel demand management in Virginia since smart scale was implemented than it was before. Next slide. Um, I think this is my last slide before we transition over to Lindsay, and that is this increased transparency. We're going to go into the portal. Um, the portal is a big part of that. That's where the applicants interact with us and submit their project ideas, but it's also where we put the project scorecards, uh, where we put mapping of what applications were submitted, where the public can go in and view the different applications uh, that were submitted each round, see the ones that were successful versus not successful. Uh, we have a smart scale dashboard, which allows uh, legislatures uh, and applicants track progress of how, how are we doing in delivering those projects? Are we delivering those projects on time and under budget? Um, so, you know, I, I feel like these web tools really have helped us with that transparency, uh, particularly the portal and um, Lindsay's gonna go over the portal and its role in helping us manage uh, and carry out the smart scale product process in Virginia. All right, thanks, Chad. Um, so, Chad described um, building the program and process to evaluate smart scale projects. But the other half of the coin, like you said, was a system that would allow for the entire evaluation process to be transparent to the public. So um, VDOT's Infrastructure Investment Division and uh, Information Technology Division engaged Geo Decisions to build a web-based application uh, for that smart scale process. And over the years, it's evolved into what we now call the Smart Portal. So the Smart Portal provides an online application process and a set of tools that help to allocate those tax dollars to the critical and right transportation projects in Virginia. Um, and the application aids in all phases of project evaluation. So it starts with the intake of applications, moves on toward VDOT screening for projects that meet overarching transportation needs of the Commonwealth, validating of those projects within the application. And then like Chad said, we display the scorecard um, for each application based on the measures that Chad went over. And then finally, all of this comes together and all of that information is made available to the public um, for a one-stop, go through the whole process, and then public transparency at the end. So just a brief timeline of the Smart Portal application. Um, like Chad said, in 2014, Terry McAuliffe signed House Bill 2, um, and that required the Commonwealth Transportation Board to develop this prioritization project, process for projects. And they said that that needed to be done by July of 2015. So Chad and the Smart Scale team started developing the program and process 
while GeoDecisions sort of raced to create this web application that would help make that process more efficient. So in 2015, um, the smart scale application known as HB2 at that time went live and uh, was ready to help with the prioritization of funding decisions. In 2016, the application was sort of rebranded. It couldn't really be known as Household 2 forever. Um, so it was called Smart Portal, sort of mirroring Smart Scale. Um, and that accommodated all of the application intake, validation, screening, and scoring um, processes. So this didn't only include Smart Scale at this point. VDOT was happy with the web application and um, wanted to include other uh, funding programs at VDOT. So Smart Portal incorporated um, that whole cycle process for the transportation alternatives program, revenue sharing program, um, highway safety, and bicycle and pedestrian safety programs as well. And then in 2017, we added more programs um, to include state of good repair, um, local bridges, and primary extensions, as well as two additional highway safety programs. So we've got a total of nine programs in the portal right now, um, as well as some other tools used internally. Hey, Lindsay, I'm going to jump in just for, just for a quick second. Please. So House Bill 2, yep. we, we were very content and happy calling it House Bill 2 until a House Bill 2 passed down in North Carolina related to bathrooms. And then that, re yep. that really put the pressure on to, uh, to come up with the smart scale came about quickly after that. Um, Right. As we, as because now when you search for House Bill Two on the web, like it wasn't bringing you to to what we were developing. It was bringing you to other stuff. So, anyway, right, right, a rebrand was needed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is what the Smart Portal homepage looks like today. Um, it gives the uh, applicants from local governments, PDCs, MPOs, um, the ability to to apply to multiple funding programs that they are eligible for. Um, and our security model allows for access of that and control to who's eligible for which programs. Um, but it also, you know, provides a login for the localities and a separate login for BDOT staff to do their evaluations, um, as well as a non-login site that's available to the public. So it's all here in the portal. So some of the benefits of having this all online um, and the process online, all in one, one place, um, building these forms online um, through the web, you can put in validation of the form. So required fields, field data types, um, application logic, such as verifying funding calculations and making sure your math adds up. Um, all these things that are really easy to accidentally mess up on a paper-based form or even just a PDF web form um, available on the web. So it has some logic built in uh, that helps with evaluating down the road. It takes time to make those corrections and coordinate back and forth with an applicant to correct a, a one from a zero. Um, so having all this data in one place also allows us to leverage common databases and reuse components across programs. So common fields are one of the things that we're trying to take advantage of. Um, these could be project names, descriptions, funding phases, different modules that can be used um, for each program in the same way. We can also clone across programs and across pro program years. So if your project is not funded in one program or cycle, you can try again um, in another program or another cycle of the same program, um, which is nice. So, and there are limits to that, but you know, they can't fund every project every year. You might as well try it again. If it's a good solid project, if it scores well, um, try again. So there's also a comments module, which allows um, back and forth between VDOT district staff um, and central office staff to correspond with the applicant and help them refine their applications, help to raise the scores up and increase their chances of being funded. And then um, the program integration module, which is a mapping integration, helps VDOT staff across um, to compare projects across different programs. Um, and that helps to eliminate the possibility of um, double dipping into multiple programs for the same project. So looking at that spatially, you could see I have a project that someone has applied for for transportation alternatives and a project that is uh, for smart scale. 
VDOT can easily see if the project sounds about the same, it's likely the same project, and they really only want to put it in one funding source. Um, so, and this uh, online application also enables much more complicated uh, mapping data to be about available for analysis. So, GIS mapping plays a big role in the portal and the different programs. Um, and so, you know, it used to be you might get a, a paper sketch of the project, which is still actually a required attachment. But applicants are now also required to map their project area, so VDOT and OIPI staff can analyze it further. So um, this also helps to capture accurate base data and information that's associated with the area, um, helps with calculating distance, which can play into some scores analysis, and um, also can integrate outside data sets. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute the Virginia Economic Development Partnership's uh, economic development sites as an example. So for mapping project areas prior to the Smart Portal tools, the map was hand-drawn by GIS staff. Um, they would have to digitize it based on what was provided by the applicant and then run analysis internally. But having this project map, air, map available to the applicants to add um, really sort of makes it a lot more efficient. So this project area map has gone through several iterations to make it easy for those applicants who might not be GIS savvy, um, and it allows them to create a spatial representation of their project. So to do this, we've created little wizards that step through each action that needs to be completed. Um, if something does not jive with what you've filled out in your application, you'll get a pop-up warning to either adjust your application or adjust your map. And then it also just gives clear direction. So there's contextual help, these simplified buttons down at the bottom. You're able to edit your project area if you don't do it correctly the first time, and a simplified summary. So this was originally just made for the Smart Scale program, but all the other programs have seen the benefit, and now they at least have to have a project area uh, mapped in their online application. So Smart Scale program also includes the validation of meeting a VTrans need, which Chad mentioned. And VTRANS is the long-range statewide multimodal uh, policy plan, and it lays out overarching visions and goals for the transportation for transportation in the Commonwealth. And it identifies priorities, like Chad was saying. Um, so in the portal, users select their need, and then they enter a justification on why their project meets that need. Um, this round, OIPI staff incorporated the VTRANS needs into their LRS, their linear referencing system so that they could use further analysis um, outside of the system. But we needed to adapt the application to incorporate this new data set, which is a bunch of little tiny segments with a ton of attribution. So it really sort of stretched the capabilities of data interpretation and presented a little bit of a processing challenge because the data set was so large. But I think that it's gonna benefit them in the long run to be able to evaluate those things on a segment level. Um, economic development site being the E in scale that Chad showed you, um, it was determined that a mapping solution would really benefit here as well. So to capture the data, that's needed to increase your score related to economic development. So this section of the portal, um, you can use parcels or draw sites, you can select existing sites, and like I mentioned before, we're now incorporating the business ready sites data from the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. They provided a service for us, we um, consume it in the portal, and then all that information is captured in the database along with the application. So then back to public transparency, um, any member of the public can access the portal and it gives them access to forms, all of the maps, they can filter based on uh, funding year and funding decisions. Um, so this is just a little map view that you would see as well as sort of the dashboard, and then they have full access to the complete form for the application. So I'm gonna to try to do a real quick little demo if I haven't gotten logged out here. So I'll show you real quick the public site. You'd come in here, you've got all of your programs up at the top, so you can narrow it down. I'm in Smart Scale, I've got a bunch of different filters. I can access you can see the fiscal year, you can see the final score for the application and whether or not it was funded. I can go in and actually view an application. 
And we've got everything organized by pearls up at the top, so the different sections of the application. You can go down to them. Oops. Got too many things going on. So they can access all of the map, or they can see the map at least, um, the justifications for VTRANS needs, features that were selected for the project, factors. Um, they cannot see the comments module, the back and forth between VDOT and the applicant, but they can see all the economic development sites, um, attachments that were added to the, There were a lot of economic development sites in that one. Um, all the attachments, all of the funding phases. Um, once the projects are scored, the scorecard is uploaded here so they can see exactly how they scored on each of the measures. And then they'll also see screening uh, and validation um, information from VDOT. So I did just want to go into an application if you were an applicant, and I'll try to do this quickly. This is our test site, so I'm not going to hurt anything. So like I said, applicants can come in, edit their application, access different sections, there's validation within the application. Add your areas, add your VTRANS needs, make sure, make sure you've justified it. Go through the delivery and funding, just wanted to show you some of this validation that's in here. So if I, you know, wanted to change my funding cost to 70,000, it's going to automatically update my total cost estimate, and that's something that you just can't get on the paper form. You'd have to do it all over again. And then with economic development sites, the cool ability here, you know, you can select parcels that uh, your site would, um, your project would affect or benefit, have benefit from the economic development sites. Select that route to it, figure out how long it's going to take to get there. It's going to automatically calculate a route for you and then incorporate all that information into the application, which is then used for scoring. So this other part that I wanted to show you is uh, the part where VDOT is going to be evaluating the project within the portal. So um, I'm a district validator and it's there's a whole workflow involved where the applications go through district validation, central office validation, higher level validation, but all of those parties have to agree. So the portal incorporates all of that workflow and logic with that workflow and make sure that everyone has agreed this application should be screened in and should be eligible for funding or not. Um, so if we go down here, we can see you know, this is my district validation. I just perform my validation, submit it, and then it's going to go to the next step in the workflow. So it's telling me that I haven't fully validated it, and that's because there is another step in that, which is a tool that we uh, recently added to the portal for validating the entire application. It's just a little tool on the side that steps the uh, reviewer through the application and lets them say whether or not that section of the application is valid. All right, so that's about, I think I should stop there so we can get through the rest of the presentation. If anybody is interested in seeing more of that, I'd be happy to give a further demo. Just going to throw this slide on here, and these are all the technologies that we use within the portal. It's hosted on Azure Cloud, um, and that was mostly because we had to spin it up very fast, uh, didn't have time for server procurement, um, but that's working out very well for us, and we're using the Esri JavaScript API to use all the mapping. Just wanted to do a little plug. This, the portal and the Smart Portal project have received multiple awards, including Outstanding Achievement, Teamwork, um, Development Award and a Project Excellence Award. So we like to take the time to brag every once in a while. So this is the lessons learned section of this um, presentation. Um, 
so the portal essentially grew organically. Um, you know, there was a, a, a fast push to get something out, but then, you know, responding to VDOT's needs of having additional programs added to the portal, um, we really had to adjust. We can't just put something out into the world and never test it again. Things are changing constantly. So the portal has really grown organically um, based on this relationship that GeoDecisions has with VDOT, IID, ITD, OIPI, and sort of listening to you know, the needs that they have and making sure that the application responds to those needs and um, continues to serve to make the process more efficient. Um, we also need the ability to adapt to change, like I was saying. Um, so our application development process is run agile. So we're constantly iterating and we can easily shift priorities. So um, legislation might come down that says you need to do this by this date. Um, we may have had a plan in place to do X number of uh, improvements to the portal, but we're going to have to switch um, priorities and make sure that we get this thing in before that date hits. Um, the scoring methodology and measures development changes uh, pretty regular. Well, I don't know. Chad, you'll have to answer that if it's regularly or not, but um, the I portal mean, needs to make adjustments. Theoretical. We, we, we <laughs> never have shifting priorities for y'all, ever. <laughs> no, no, never. <laughs> never. <laughs> So, but, you know, being agile allows our team to say, okay, well, we're only going to plan for, you know, we've got a long range plan, but each week we, or each sprint, we have a plan for what we're going to accomplish and we can adjust as needed. But yeah, the, uh, if um, measures or the process change, the portal needs to adjust as well. Um, and Chad, I think this slide is yours. Yep. Just some free advice, um, you know, be open, have good communication. I think communication both within your your team as well as with the stakeholders is really important. Be sure to respond. You're going to get a lot of feedback. If you're thinking about doing this in your state or region, you're going to get feedback. You're going to get a lot of concerns. Um, respond timely and um, directly. Um, people really appreciate that. I think I touched on this earlier, but be transparent. We, in of three rounds, there were two rounds where we messed up some scoring. Um, we did the analysis and determined it wasn't going to change what our staff recommended funding scenario was. So there was that little that little devil popping up on your shoulder saying, "Well, it doesn't matter, so you don't need to make it. You know, don't shine the light on it." Um, but we decided the next meeting with the board to bring it to their attention, explain to them what the issue was, why there was a mistake or why there was an error, how we fixed it, what the impact was, which hopefully the good thing was there wasn't an impact, um, and how we were going to prevent it from happening in the future. And I think that has garnered more trust in us coming to them when we mess up and explain and explaining ourselves um, than us just, you know, sweeping it under, under the rug. Um, you're never going to get it right. This process, as um, Lindsay's earlier slide, has evolved. As the portal has evolved, so has the smart skill process. We've identified issues each round where it just it's a head scratcher. This, this result is not really making sense. Um, and so we see it as a living, breathing process that evolves over time. Um, uh, challenge your sort of the wagon rut that you're in. Uh, it was really hard for us to focus on outcomes, but I think it was the right call. Um, less control may be beneficial, and here's what I mean by that. It surprises a lot of other states that VDOT, the state, cannot submit projects for smart scale. And the reason being is, if you don't have local and regional support for a project, we have way more needs than we could ever fund. Why are we going to push a project down a, a community's throat? And that, you know, the 460 project, the 29 bypass, there were just multiple examples where that's not good public policy. So the board can submit two 
applications each round uh, statewide, but VDOT, DRPT, the modal agencies in Virginia cannot submit uh, a project. We can advocate for a project and we can try to get a PDC or MPO or locality to submit it on our behalf, but we are not an eligible applicant. Uh, we also thought that was a conflict of interest being that we were going to be the ones screening and scoring the projects in the end. Um, and then again, I always stress this, strongly consider you can sit, strongly consider, recommend that you consider uh, examining benefits relative to the cost. I've seen a lot of good come out of that um, and allowing us to accomplish more with less. And um, next slide. Ah, moving forward. So we're not done with the portal. Uh, one of the things we're currently working with Lindsay and her team at GeoDecisions on is the portal to date has focused on the intake of applications. <clears throat> what we're working on now is leveraging the portal as a tool to work with the applicants in doing planning and project development and alternatives testing. So the idea is there'll be a module <clears throat> sort of before the application intake where you can see where all the needs are and you can hone in on a particular area and you can start to develop a project idea and you can maybe develop three alternatives and you can test them uh, and see which one is likely going to do better and get feedback from the state on cost estimation and constructability and right away and utility impacts. And it'd be a collaborative platform where the Commonwealth can work with the applicant community to develop a, uh, uh, a, a portfolio, if you will, of planned and thought out improvements that you then can say, all right, now I want to apply for that. And all that data ports over into an application uh, to submit for funding, whether that's TAP or revenue sharing. Um, we think it will help us with collaboration um, and communication. Um, it'll allow us to develop or identify risk much earlier in the planning process. And who knows what, you know, what we may decide to add to the portal next. Um, but that's currently what we have on the horizon of the next sort of evolution um, of the smart portal. All right. So, Joelle, I think you wanted to open it up for questions at this point. Yep. Thanks, Chad and Lindsay. We really appreciate it. As a reminder, everybody, you can type your questions into the Q&A window if you haven't already. Um, we do want to get to just a couple of them and still be cognizant of everybody's time. So first up is a relatively straightforward one. How long did it take you to develop the initial smart scale process? Uh, it was around 14 to 16 months uh, from when the legislation passed to we had, we had a process that the board adopted that was going to guide the first round um, of, of smart scale. Okay, thanks. And the next question is, is everything entered into smart the smart portal application visible to the public? Um, I can take this one, Chad. So right now, no. Um, the comments module that is sort of the back and forth between VDOT and the applicant is not available. Um, some of the screening decisions, if they're going back and forth, uh, those are not going to be available as well. I will say that VDOT was, you know, staff was sort of told, you know, this, this, this is all playable. You need to make sure that you're entering in information that could be, you know, read by the public. Um, but the public can access everything that's on the form, um, all of the mapping, all of the scores, all the scorecards. Um, so most of the uh, um, application is available to the public. Yeah. Great. And we'll just do one more question. How often are the smart scale scoring measures updated and how do you communicate that to the public? All right, so we update the measures each round. So we have the initial round one measures and then after round one, after each round we do, you know, some people call it postmortem, 
but we do a pretty extensive process review of what went well, both procedurally, workflow related, what worked in the portal, didn't work. But we also look at the methods, the measures themselves, the scores, and we will identify any issues that we see. So let me give you a, first, a good example from the first round. First round, we, based on the map of the project, we looked at a buffer around the project and we looked at seven areas of sensitivity, wetland streams, uh, uh, 4F properties, you know, the typical sort of environmental sensitive things that you would look at. And we noticed that there were, I think it was seven projects in our staff recommended funding scenario that got over 90% of their score from that one measure, which told us the projects aren't alleviating congestion or safety or helping people get access to jobs. They just happen to not be near anything environmentally sensitive. And we felt like that by itself was not a good way to fund projects, just because they happen to be not near a stream or a wetland, um, that there needed to be some other benefit coming out of the project, other transportation benefit. So we revised that measure and that approach and method uh, between round one and round two to sort of address that observation that we had. And we've done that each round. Um, but I would say that the overarching process is pretty much the same. It's more evolutionary, you know, we're slightly evolving from round to round, identifying weaknesses, putting in. Um, and so from round to round, it's not a completely different process. It's 95% of what we did before with just some enhancing. Great. Thanks, Chad and Lindsay. That's about all we have time for today. For those of you who were participating to receive a PDH or GISP credit, you will receive a follow-up email in the coming weeks with the certificates. And we're going to be continuing this series throughout 2020, so I hope you can join us. Check your email or the GeoDecisions or Gannett Fleming LinkedIn pages for more information about upcoming webinars. If you have an idea for additional topics or in, are interested in co-presenting with one of our subject matter experts, please email water at gfnet.com. On behalf of the entire GeoDecisions and Gannett Fleming team, thank you for joining us and we hope you have a great day.